Okay, well, uh, good afternoon. I hope everybody had a good lunch. Uh, and uh, we do want to put in a little bit of an advertisement for the meeting in, uh, in August. So we hope to see you all there. Uh, I'm joined uh, now for this session uh, by Christina Covali, who is our uh, lead of our general GI group. Uh, and this uh, particular session is focused on uh, functional bowel disorders. And uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker. I think that uh, Jennifer has uh, maybe sacrificed the most to, to come and join us today. Uh, as many of you know, uh, she's moved from Emory to take over the GI division chief at, uh, uh, at Colorado. Uh, she's also the, the president of the ASGE this year. And um, so she's had an incredibly busy year and, and yet found the time and, uh, to, to join us. So uh, Jennifer, we're extremely um, uh, pleased and, and happy to have you here. We've asked uh, Jennifer to talk about um, best options for management of IBS, both uh, for diarrhea and constipation. So, Jennifer, welcome. Thank you so much, Rob. And thank you, everyone, and uh, for the, the course organizers and the staff for organizing this wonderful course. It's really been great, and it's just beautiful to see you all here. Um, so yes, I was asked to talk about the best options for the management of irritable bowel syndrome. Um, these are my disclosures. So by the, uh, the close of this talk, so my objectives for you are number one, to describe the clinical manifestations of irritable bowel syndrome, and then two, to just d discuss and help you to identify how to navigate the assessment of these patients. And then last, lastly, to recall the evidence-based treatment options for the uh, management of IBS. And we'll be reviewing both the ACG as well as the AGA guidelines. So I want to start with a typical case that we all would see in our practices. This is a 32-year-old woman who presents with a more than 10-year history of, of bloating. Right? And so one of the key things here is that these patients have typically chronic symptoms. Um, she reports passing one to two hard stools per week, uh, and also she has some uh, lower left quadrant abdominal pain or discomfort. She does say that pretty much whatever she eats causes her to, to have these symptoms, and, and I don't know about you guys, but I hear it a lot. Sometimes patients say even water causes me to bloat, um, and that may be hard to understand, but that's very real for many patients. She really, it's impacted her quality of life. She really doesn't want to go out because, um, because she doesn't feel good. She's tried a gluten-free diet as well as some lactose-free uh, diets and really has not had much success. So what do we do with these, these patients? It's oftentimes very, very challenging. But nonetheless, it's common. Right? It's the prevalence is about 10 to 15 percent worldwide. And in fact, the United States, about 40 million people have the diagnosis of irritable bowel syndrome. They haven't necessarily seen us in the office yet, but they carry that diagnosis as, as people. And we only see a, about 25 percent of those, pa those people as patients in our offices. It is one of the most commonly diagnosed gastrointestinal disorders. And while many of us you know, are, uh, do a lot of procedures, um, particularly advanced procedures, it's, it's a diagnosis that we all will have to manage in our careers. And so it's important that we, we t target in the way in which we approach these patients. It is more common in women, about one and a half to two times more common in women. We don't fully understand why that's the case, but it may be secondary to some um, neurohormonal differences, as well as just some psychosocial uh, nurturing uh, that impacts how, how women uh, see their bodies and maybe even um, manage stress and coping. And then it, it is associated with greater than $30 billion annually in direct as well as indirect costs, like time off from work and things of that nature. So this is probably the most important slide that, that um, I will present to you today, and I'm going to present it again because it is key. In order to really make an impact with these patients, building that alliance with them is the, is the most important thing you can do. So when they come to you, number one, you confirm the diagnosis, and really you, you use a positive diagnostic strategy, right? The days of saying that this is a diagnosis of exclusion are over, right? This is a positive symptom-based um, diagnosis. And then, and then it's important to validate what these patients are, 
are feeling, right? And then acknowledge that you don't fully understand why. Why is this happening? But acknowledge that it is something that is real to them and that you will do your very best to help them manage their symptoms in a, in a stepwise process. So let's define irritable bowel syndrome. So as um, Dr. Carillis mentioned earlier, that now we talk about Rome 4 criteria for functional bowel disorders. However, they, you know, the, the Rome folks are working on five. But currently, the most important aspects of Rome 4 criteria for IBS include um, a patient reporting that he or she has recurrent abdominal pain that occurs at least one day per week um, in the last three months. And it's really important that these symptoms have been going on for at least six months before they come to you and you give them that diagnosis. So it's really important to establish some sense of chronicity for these patients. And in, associ in um, association with the abdominal pain, oftentimes this is related to defecation. Um, and also it's change in the frequency of the stool, not necessarily improved, uh, with defecation. Again, that's a little different from the Rome 3 criteria, but in some way associated. Um, and, and I oftentimes, obviously, we, we use the Bristol stool uh, form scale. Um, sometimes patients will, will tell you, you know, I have, a, I have a one or I have a seven because they've been online. And, um, you know, that online university is powerful, right? So, um, but still, when they tell me that, or I'll ask, when, I, when they tell me I have a, my, school, my stool looks like pellet, you know, like rabbit poop, then I'm thinking, I'm, I'm going squarely, squarely to colon transit. And I'm like, that colon is slow, right? And so as I'm thinking about that, then I'm thinking about ways in which I can stimulate transit, right? If they tell me that it's loose and it's warty, it's mushy, I'm like, ooh, that colon is spasming and it's fast, and I'm trying to slow it down. So it is important to, to understand what that stool looks like. So while I would love for this diagram to be more simple, it is not uh, because the etiology of IBS is so complex. But at the core of it, we know that it's some dysregulation between the brain and the gut. Again, there's a lot of factors that are playing into that. We believe that there's some genetic predisposition perhaps in some patients, but then also that there may be some environmental factors that, that we don't fully understand. We also know that there's psychological factors that can affect GI motility and that, that um, connection or that uh, communication between the brain and the gut. Things like anxiety, stress, and hypervigilance. Uh, and this can also alter those, um, the visceral uh, signals that are coming from the central nervous system. We also know that there's some alterations in uh, the gut microbiome in many of these patients, and we'll hear later uh, from Dr. Johnson about that. And then there also may be some microscopic inflammation that's associated with cytokine release that is controlling motility, uh, as well as gut function. But again, at the core is that dysregulation between the brain and the gut. So again, that positive diagnostic strategy is key in IBS. So we get a thorough um, history and exam, assess symptoms, make sure there are no alarm features like bleeding, weight loss, um, any, any other significant family history. And then also use that symptom-based criteria that we talked about, that is very key. And let patients know that, hey, this, this, your symptoms are classic of irritable bowel syndrome, and here is why. They really appreciate that from us. And really, as far as diagnostic testing, it should be limited and not exhaustive. So what should we do? So the ACG recommends um, that if someone is, has, is age appropriate for colorectal cancer screening and they have this abdominal pain and, and pain and change in bowel habits, do screen, right? And typically we would do that in these patients with a colonoscopy, particularly if they have diarrhea. Other things that we may do in patients who are not necessarily of screening age is to do a CRP or a fecal calprotectin just to make sure we're not, we're not dealing with some IBD in patients who have IBSD. And then also a, a celiac, ruling out celiac disease is also important in these patients. And if you do a colonoscopy because these symptoms, symptoms are just so chronic or maybe they have had some weight loss, make sure you do biopsies to rule out microscopic colitis. And then for IBS mix, same thing, because they're, they're having perhaps alternating diarrhea and constipation, consider doing the uh, fecal calprotectin or CRP and ruling out celiac disease. 
Now, the other thing I really want to emphasize is that in patients who have constipation that is refractory to some of the over-the-counter or even pharmacological therapies that we try, um, then, and they are, explain, they are uh, describing to you some straining and having to digitate to get the stool to come out or, um, you know, it, just really having to do different maneuvers, and, I, and I've heard it all, to get the stool to come out. Think about pelvic floor dysfunction and refer them for physi physiological testing. So in terms of colonoscopy in these patients, the yield is, is pretty small. So this recent meta-analysis um, by Wu and colleagues of, of 12 studies, and it included about 29,000 patients, and they looked at the prevalence of other GI diagnosis in patients presenting with irritable bowel syndrome. And as you can see in this panel on the, on the left, that patients who are greater than the age of um, 50, typically even the presence of colorectal cancer, the pool prep, pooled prevalence was only 1.72. Now, in these patients who, particularly who presented with diarrhea, the pool prevalence of microscopic colitis, that's what the MC is, it was 5.12. So the yield for microscopic colitis in these patients with diarrhea is, is, is higher uh, compared to some of the other diagnoses. And it's similar for um, patients who are under the age of 40. So in terms of dietary considerations in irritable bowel syndrome, so again, patients will often say everything triggers me, but sometimes they'll, just, they'll, they'll identify some a very specific uh, uh, meal-related items. And so one of the things that we talk about a lot is these, these FODMAPs. So these are fermentable oligo dye monosaccharides and polyols. And they're basically carbs. And, and oftentimes they're not digested well, they ferment in the colon and pr produce a lot of uh, gas. And then that manifests as bloating. And low FODMAP diets have been shown to improve overall symptom scores compared to a typical diet in IBS patients. There are other food antigens as well that can trigger these symptoms. And so in many people, patients will come to us and say, hey, I've tried a gluten-free diet, and it actually works. And it's not because they have celiac, but because they just cannot uh, digest that gluten protein very well, and so they have a lot of bloating and gas. And so what are these five maps? Again, these are these carbohydrates. So and many of the things that we just ate, okay? So not only are you feeling maybe a little bit tired, but you may be feeling a little bit bloated, and this is why. Um, and it was good, by the way, so thank you. Um, so many of the things like, um, you know, broccoli and, and cabbage and uh, a lot of very healthy foods can cause a lot of bloating and discomfort. So making sure that patients are aware of these is really important. Now what I do though, I don't, I really emphasize, I do not want patients to be restrictive in their diets. So, you know, just making patients aware of what these, these, um, these items are and what could be triggering them is important because already they're, they're restrictive and we don't want to exacerbate that. So just be very careful about how you communicate that. So then how do we start? Diet, lifestyle modification is always key. Um, oftentimes a stool diary, food diary can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Exercise and stress reduction. If you, if you know that your patient or you sense that your patient has some anxiety or stress related to their symptoms, consider a neuromodulator early, right, as opposed to later early. And we'll talk a little bit about that. The evidence for probiotics, although we use them all the time, the evidence is not good, so it's not typically recommended. Now, this is a huge table, but I wanted to summarize the AGA and ACG evidence-based recommendations for the various um, pharmacologic therapies for ir irritable bowel syndrome, constipation predominant. So fiber, specifically soluble. Insoluble causes a lot of gas and bloating. So soluble fiber can be very helpful. The evidence for that is moderate, but the ACG recommendation is strong. And then the PEG solutions, good if you just have constipation, but really with the, with the abdominal pain component, not that helpful. The strongest evidence is with the, um, the uh, linaclotide, which is a guanylate cyclase C uh, receptor agonist. A lot of these things are osmotic, so they trigger um, water secretion into the lumen and then improving stool consistency and evacuation. Um, and then the 5-HT uh, agonist to gasserod, which was, was on the market, was pulled off the market in 2007. That was, the, that was a rough day for, for many of us who treat many of these patients because it is, can be very effective in IBS and in chronic constipation. But it stimulates uh, gut transit and can be very helpful for pain as well. This new medication called tenapinor, 
um, is a, a sodium hydrogen exchange uh, receptor um, inhibitor. And what it does is it traps water and phosphate into the lumen, and then um, it helps to stimulate tr um, colonic transit and also modulates pa pain through the TRPV receptor. Uh, this was a study that looked at, uh, it was a dose ranging study, and it showed that the five, 50 milligrams BID uh, was better than all doses, including placebo in patients in a, in a phase two study. Major um, side effects for many of these, these medications, including this one, is diarrhea. So that's just something that you have to warn pa patients about and then, and then modify uh, the dose, perhaps. And then for IBSD, again, um, the AGA and ACG recommendations are similar. Quality of evidence for many of these, um, for some of the trials, is, is moderate to low because there's just not a lot of large randomized trials and that the, the uh, difference between placebo and drug is, is never dramatic, right? But even that slight improvement is, is important for many patients. Um, in terms of the, I want to highlight rifaximin. Rifaximin uh, is a non-absorbable oral antibiotic that can be very helpful in patients who have IBSD, particularly if they have bloating. So if they, if they come to you and say, I'm bloated, and then there are significant others in the room, and you ask them if they have flatulence, and they go, yes, right? So that is your patient who may be, um, who may benefit. And studies have shown that up to three doses can be very effective in patients uh, with IBSD, and particularly if they have gas and bloating. And the quality of the evidence is, is moderate with the conditional AGA recommendation, but a strong ACG recommendation. And then for TCAs and SSRIs, so for, t for tricyclic antidepressants, uh, it can be very helpful for IBS, particularly IBSD. Uh, not only does it slow down the colonic transit, but also to modulate pain. The SSRIs have not been shown to be as effective, and so there is a, it's been, the AJ recommends against using them for IBS-D, uh, and that is conditional. So um, elaxadiline, I do want to talk about that uh, very briefly. It is one of the newer medications for IBS-D. Um, and it is a um, mu and kappa opioid receptor agonist and a gamma receptor antagonist. So what it does, it helps slow transit and also help with pain. These, these two studies are the pivotal studies that looked at the effectiveness of eluxadiline compared to uh, placebo, and, and it was found to be effective in these two large studies. In terms of antidepressants, we know, as I mentioned, that they can be very helpful in IBS, particularly IBS-D. Uh, this meta-analysis by Ford and colleagues, they looked at 18 randomized trials, and it does improve global IBS symptoms. Uh, SSRIs, they can increase colonic uh, transit in IBS-C, but not as effective. And, in term, and, and one of the uh, major uh, topics I do want to touch on is these adjunctive psychological therapies. Things like gut-focused CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy has found to be very effective in um, randomized controls trials um, compared to just routine care, and as has uh, gut-directed hypnotherapy. But there are other uh, types of psychological therapies that are used as ad adjuncts to medical therapies, such as acceptance and commi uh, um, commitment therapy, as well as mindfulness approaches. And then there's these, um, you know, these other, these therapies I just mentioned are limited just by cost, access to psychologists, but there are digital therapies that patients can purchase and have apps on their phones, such as uh, Zemedy and Mahana, uh, that have also found to be uh, very effective. So I just want to uh, summarize in terms of the overall approach to patients with IBS. Um, our first-line therapies we talked about here on the, on the left side, patients who don't respond to the d diet and lifestyle or even um, fiber and antispasmodics, you can give uh, elocitron for diarrhea as, um, as you can eluxatiline for constipation, the segretagogues that I mentioned to you, um, and then also your 5-HT4 agonists that stimulate colonic transit. And then, if, and then in, as an adju adjuvant therapy to those um, recommendations, tricyclics are very effective as are gut-directed therapies. So again, building that trust and that alliance is important, reassuring them that this is what you have um, and, and acknowledging their symptoms is gonna go a long way. So thank you for your attention and... Uh,
Thank you so much, uh, Christy. Thank you. So next, a pleasure for me to introduce Dave Johnson. Uh, he is one of our emeritus faculty members. I, I don't think we could have this meeting without David. Uh, he's a wonderful friend, but uh, also a, an incredible clinician and with a, a wide area of uh, interest and expertise. On this particular occasion, uh, at least on this session, we've asked him to talk about uh, the biome, the, uh, an update on the gut biome, and um, is it height, hope, or is it the answer? David, welcome. Thanks, Robin. <clears throat> Particularly, it's a pleasure to be here. The answer, I don't know it's the answer, but I'm gonna discuss what the possibilities are. So, to begin with, the compliments to the, to the directors. If anybody's been watching the, the news and the weather over the last uh, week, you've seen the Midwest and the Northeast just been horribly stricken. And, and snapshots are horrifying as you look uh, around the country and look at us, it's 70 and sunny. I mean, come on, really? Why doesn't everybody live in Orlando? So compliments to the course directors, the meeting planners, the location is phenomenal. So before I get you to look forward to the concept of the microbiome is, is the answer to all our ailments, I wanna take a quick look back. Antony von Leeuwenhoek is reported as seeing this via his self-made microscope, <clears throat> small animacules, he called, he said, a moving very prettily <clears throat> in stools in the dental plaque. And the scientific world was just not quite ready at that point because first they needed to stumble on the fact that germs cause disease, much less that we get to some awareness that long later, these little creatures are resident in the human body and generally foster health. So the goals for today are we're to begin to start with some definitions. We'll talk about misperceptions and testing and, and interpretation. You think these are really critical when you start to look at biomic articles, which seem to be replete in the literature. Every journal, every day, you see something. And then we'll talk about GI, particular GI diseases and some conditions, not necessarily reflecting diseases, but the list is long. We'll go through this very pejoratively, but quickly going from the esophagus, and I'll end up on aging, and I won't tell you what that means because I change that definition every year. The direction I'll leave you with is some guidance and wisdom, hopefully, that it can impart and imply that you will do well when you start to look at these biomic challenges. Let's start with the definition. We, we throw the terms around microbiome and biome, and, and it's really the, the, the gut microbiome is a variety of microbes, in particular, it's, it's bacteria primarily, fungi mostly yeast, <clears throat> viruses and archaea. Archaea are, are unicellular, they're prokaryocytes, so prokaryocytes are bacteria and archaea. And an example of archaea, if you've ever been to Yellowstone, they're thermophilic type organisms and so they hang in those regions, so the color metrics that you see in those areas are reflective of richness of archaea. The microbiota, if we talk about the definition, is a collection of microbes in, in a given area. The microbiota is specific to an area, so the oral or the gut microbiota. And these are particularly in the GI tract as it relates to bacteria uh, or microbiomes, in particular bacteroides and firmicutes. Those are the two that account for 90% of bacteria in our, in our gut. In contradistinction, the microbiome, again, terms used interchangeably, refers to a collection of genomes from a defined environment. So the microbial structure and elements, the metabolites, the environment around it. So if we talk the microbiome here in this room, we talk about the ceiling, the walls, the, the floor beneath us, the pe person sitting next to you, that's the microbiome, even though that they're interchangeably, the microbiome is a much broader spectrum. <clears throat> now, some misconceptions. One is that different laboratory and computational methods will all yield the same results. That's not at all the case. That's being modified in particular by technology and looking at new, new techniques and next-gen sequencing, particular ways that we can unify these techniques as they're starting to apply to the microbiome. Stabilization is a real key because as soon as you take a stool and excrete it, your microbiome changes dramatically because the bacteria are enriched and now they have an opportunity to participate in an area now they're particularly exposed to air. And the metabolites can be used where they generate different bacterial strains and dominances using the enrichment of the nutrients in the stool as it's excreted so it changes dramatically and must be stabilized right away. Everyone has the same microbiome. We'll talk about footprints and microbiome. Is that really applicable? Does everybody have the same? And is it stable? When we talk about stability, we don't know what time it was done, what day of the week, maybe what season, what's the environment around it, because it's not necessarily stable. And does the excretion, as you see it in stool, reflect what's really going on in the right colon or in the small bowel, per se? And in particular, those are not true either. To show it, how things can change. This is a study that we did in animals and mice a couple of years ago now, but looked at mice and interrupted their sleep cycle with a whisker wheel, and then we sent the residents in to get the stool. 
they were thrilled. And in particular, then we looked at the microbiome, and what you see is an undulation in, in the normal, uh, you start here and you finish here, but through the course of the day, you vary, vary your, your stool microbiome. So if you just check it at one hour and look at it six hours later, it may not be the same. And we inverted that by disruption of sleep. So here, sleep was the variable. And in fact, we showed then there were corresponding evidences of change, not only in the microbiome, but in the brain. And, and the translocation risk was also evident because it also changed mucosal integrity. Again, sleep effect makes dramatic effect on the biome. And then is right equal left? And this is a study that we just published a couple months ago. But we looked at unique uh, bacteria that were in the stool, uh, excreted stool versus the stool that was uh, procured through a hydrocolonic deliverable. So we timed that deliverable and looked at the excreted stool. We saw 59, 25% of these had a stool that was unique, biome. But looking at the excreted stool delivered by timed participation of, of when that stool came out, we attributed it to right colon, left colon, or, or uh, transverse colon. And you can see the effluents uh, reflective of different biomes uh, depending on the timing of that. So right doesn't equal left. And then what about with age? Is it stable through the context of unborn to elderly? And I, I cringed when I saw this picture because I saw the person that was in the 65 to 80 range Dr. Haas and I are in that range, and I, I didn't like the picture I saw, so it is not reflective <laughs> of elderly in any way when you talk 65, we call it genetic maturity. And, and as we look at the, the biome changes through the course of what we, we can attribute over time, just look at the color metric changes, just to give you a perception of, of the change that occurs as we age. Lots of things go uh, as we get older, some of them are not always so good. One of the concepts when we move to the esophagus it starts with a paradigm shift that Stu Speckler and Rhonda Souza uh, developed in very seminal work they were put in JAMA. They looked at the traditional notion of acid causes injury because it's a contact, right? And it's a direct chemical injury on the epithelium and that delivers histologic changes and the inflammatory changes result as that. What they showed was not the case. So the acid in the exposure didn't mitigate a response right there. It may have been adjacent to that. And they suggested that this was something that was submucosal generated. And it resolved, a, a, it provoked one of our former speakers today, Dr. Kurilis, to put together an article that said, you know, it's the turning of the pathogenesis. It's not rain on the roof. It's maybe the basement because it's turning on something from the basement leading to a expression retrograde, primarily likely driven through cytokine expression. Well, this uh, leads to the esophagus and the biome. And if we talk about the rain on the roof, the gastric acid burning through the roof, the tradition is that's what causes the pain and the erosions and irritations. But a new concept is the bacteria mitigate the acid in the esophagus and how it's, it's potentially handled. So acid in the esophagus, now in the presence of a gram-negative, gram-positive balance that's equivalent and, and balanced, doesn't necessarily invoke a necessary response of an injury. But it can be, by imbalance, lead to development through pathways, particularly because the endotoxins you can develop with lipopolysaccharides, gram negatives in the, in, the, uh, in the shell of the gram negatives, and driving things through pathways like total like receptor pathways now lead to an inflammation in the submucosa, cytokine expression, leading to that same lymphocyte infiltration, but now a retrograde response of inflammation. So causing barrier breaks, microscopic if you had NERD, or macroscopic if you had a roof esophagitis. So it's the basement, not the roof, mitigating the potential, again, through cytokine expression. So when we talk about the esophageal diseases, and I was born and bred as an esophagologist when I, when I started with Don Castell, but the esophagus now has got tremendous implications that it may be biomic, at least in some parts, and particularly relates to things like reflux disease or Barrett's esophagus or esophageal adenocarcinoma and eosinophilic esophagitis. This comes from our recent book on the esophageal microbiome. But I raise this not for you to remember all these things, but just to emphasize in the yellow we see things that are amplified and in the green we see things that are diminished. So changes in biologic footprints that are correlated with certain disease states. You heard from Dr. Christie a lot, an excellent discussion about some of the brain-gut interactions, but there are circulating short-chain fatty acids, particularly derived from the gut microbiome, but these are important because they maintain the integrity of what our brain barrier has. And this increased brain barrier integrity limits some undesirable metabolites that can get there, like lipopolysaccharides, the endotoxins we see from gram negatives, bacterial lipoprotein or flagellin. And these are compounds that are known as microbe-associated molecular patterns that are produced by gut bacteria. 
and they influence neuroimmune function. So we're talking about brain-gut axis a lot when we start now talking about immune function. And they can stimulate release of a host of cytokines, particularly things like TNF-alpha or IL-6 or IL-1-beta. So in particular, when they get these cytokines up and going, they can cross the blood-brain barrier, and these can activate on the brain level now microglii or neuron alterations that can alter neurologic function change in mood and behavior, and you've heard some of the interactions in Dr. Christie's brilliant talk of how this can potentially be important, but it's again reflective of gut bacteria changes, and these produce neurotransmitters that are really incredibly active, and so this gut bacteria is active, not passive, in relation with the, with the brain. So When we talk about and follow up with the microbiome and irritable bowel syndrome, the, the, Dr. Christie again alluded to effectiveness with the rifaximin, the number needed to treat is very easy, but we're directing things towards the microbiome. Over the last five years, I found 30 randomized controlled trials and, and 10 studies actually published on this topic, but we're talking about microbial changes in the irritable bowel. So a point here is that meta-analysis shows no cl clear superiority if you try and change that biome by fecal transplant. There's been a lot of interest in that, and, and this is relative to placebo. The exception in here is the stool microbiome changes by FMT were assessed separately if you gave it by capsule. And there was a signal for efficacy, at least in two of the studies, a duodenal capsule may actually impose a potential more durable change, but a delivery from the upper esophageal entry in relation to a repeat in four weeks or a salvage therapy at one year. So there is some concept of mitigation strategy for irritable bowel by fecal transplant. Now moving to colitis makes sense that there would be something related to the biome, and this is something that was just published in Inflammatory Bowel Disease just a month ago, but looking at the gut microbiome in patients with long-term remission and normal. So looking at this, they, there were two indices, the Shannon index and the Chow index. These are measures of diversity, so you want to have more diversity when you have a better biomic balance for your colon, and in fact, their diversity was much lower as you looked at active flare or in recent, uh, recent uh, short-term remission for those patients with colitis. So again, highly statistically different. Another por por portrayal of this looking at a three-dimensional cartoon, if you will, on graphics here, you can see the separation from normal and long-term remission versus the patients in short-term remission and active flare. The same with Crohn's disease. There's a biome, at least suggestion, this again, recent data looking at the potential association developing it if you had certain bacterial models uh, or predictors. And they, they modeled this and they looked at disease probability, uh, disease-free probability, and they followed this over a 10-year horizon and they derived a microbial risk score model and they transferred this into a low and high score. And what they found was is if you were in the low score, you had a reduced risk or an increased risk uh, if you had a high score of, of maintaining, uh, of developing a di Crohn's disease over the course of that 10 year period. And the footprint that was really dominant in this model was Anchormansii mucinophilia. And so again, certain things gave you a, high, a hazard ratio that was increased based on biome and predictability for here inflammatory bowel disease. To underscore the, the importance of inflammatory bowel disease and biome, I think, is given further credence from the recent Rome criteria they convened on fecal transplant in specific in inflammatory bowel disease. And what they concluded were very interesting concepts of reiteration biome is involved. So they said that the precise, uh, precise uh, pathology of inflammatory bowel disease was unknown. However, it was thought to be multifactorial genetics and host immune responses, but in particular in the environment and recognized they importantly point out the gut microbiome. So with that, they said there is a result of loss of this homeostasis and balance in the colon between the immune system and the gut microbiome, again implying how the biome is now a derivative of the pathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease. And this res response by the, the colitis is certainly a dysregulation of the intolerance to the microbiome and disruption of the epithelial barrier then separates the microorganisms from the underlying tissue, again mitigating the, the damage we see with colitis. And it may then contribute to or perpetuate inflammatory bowel disease. So again, reiteration of biomic involvement in inflammatory bowel disease. How about colon cancer? There's a lot on this one. And it can, by four different pathways, be at least linked to colon cancer. One is changes in the bacteria that ferment fiber and decrease the short-chain fatty acids, the good things that we like for maintaining gut homeostasis by decreasing things like bacteroides species. It can initiate things through particular E. coli as an example, and the derivative here that's damaging is the colobactin toxin, which 
promotes a proliferative damage in, in, in DNA damage. So again, things that go awry based on bacterial change. It can promote damage through back, B. fragilis by the production of fragilisin, which induces a procarcinogenic means through a T helper cell type of pathway, or it can lead to progression of disease. In particular, the example here is through fusobacter binding uh, to E. cadherin, which promotes a proliferative advantage or inv invasion as it relates to colon cancer. Important to recognize some of the effects of the, the biome on immunotherapy, and I'll come back to this when we talk about a little bit of the oncogenetics later today, but the biome directly affects some chemotherapy, particularly through an, a mechanism called timer, and this stands for a very erudite type of thing, translocation, immunomodulation, metabolism, enzymatic degradation, reduced diversity, whatever, the timer mechanism, and the important here is it, it's got a discriminant role in the immune responses generated by certain chemotherapy. And the efficacy depends on those gut bacteria being present. And we look about things that it regulates. It regulates a lot of the therapy that we see in our cancer patients with GI cancers, things like 5-FU, gemcitabine, oxaplatin, cyclophosphamide. So again, gut bacteria facilitates the activity of those biomic uh, responses in, in particular. What we're starting to see is an era of what I call gut uh, ecology, uh, on, uh, ecologic oncology. We know that these things are going to work better if certain bacteria are there. You heard from Dr. Shady this morning about the immunologic uh, and disease states as it relates to potentially the allegation of biome and, and liver disease. And more and more we see there's a delicate interaction here. It certainly prevents harmful to harmless bacteria and the interaction here is ever expanding. The, the list gets daily and incremental. The evidence gets stronger from a host of things as it relates to liver. And it's because it's the proximity. It's in the neighborhood, right? The gut is right there with the liver, and the bacterial changes in the gut have rapid access, particularly driving through the gram negatives and the lipopolysaccharides, right to the liver. And this whole proximity and deliverables of certain bacteria carries with it a host of metabolic uh, outcomes that are not always good and promote this pro-inflammatory cytokine response, which at the liver level can again invoke the production of chemokines and chemokines and cytokines and fibrogenic factors. Looking at different biologic footprints, I just want to give you the evidence that there are different areas and not to recognize the footprint specifically, but just to show as we go from non-alcoholic liver disease, the footprint is different as it relates to alcohol-related disease or cirrhosis or hepatocellular carcinoma. Just recognizing the footprint suggestions here are there and they may potentially be subject to mitigation strategies if we can figure out how to best do that. A quick word about obesity, it's rampant in the, in the world, but microbial changes show a preventive effect if you have the good diversity against long-term weight gain, and that's in health. But in fact, we live in the Western area, and the Westernization of diet has led to all this microbial diversity, and again, it just doesn't factor well. And this composition leads to a host of things that further promulgate that through things like weight gain and obesity and the diabetes. But these are, can be a positive or negative. You've been, the bacteria changes in a positive way, it can affect you in the weight in a good way, or on the adverse thing, it can go opposite towards obesity. So it's a complex interaction. It's not just change the bacteria because you've got other things. You've got genetics, environment, diet, sleep patterns. All these things are very important. I just posted a thing, uh, my most recent post on Medscape on GI effects on menopause. And I want to just highlight some of the things as it relates to the microbiome here. The biome is changing in menopause. And the biomic changes that Dr. Uh, Christie alluded to, you may see food intolerances, and it, not just because of age. It's the, the biome change that we see with menopause. And menopause can be with age or it can be surgical. And there's a number of now animal studies that show the gut biome changes are related to menopause, surgical or activity related uh, uh, to increase aging. But it, it then also carries with it obesity markers and things that spatial memory changes, again, related to the biome, in particular in menopause. There are increases in NAFL. We heard the discussion this morning as it relates to this, but there are beneficial changes that relate to biome, whether or not they respond to transdermal or oral uh, uh, estrogen replacement therapy. And there's accumulating evidence that this is very important, that it changes the process of osteoporosis. The gut bacteria is very active in the osteoporotic pathway, and, and a variety of things that, that are important. In particular, when you look at this, there are clinical findings related to gut bacteria and mineral changes associated with osteomalacia, and what happens with the bacteria changes in menopause, you get high levels of pro-inflammatory factors, in particular TNF-alpha, interleukin, but osteoclastic activity. So surgical or 
age-wise, menopause, you have a biome change as it relates to the idea of, of changes. Now, you'd be remiss to leave out COVID in the world that we've lived in the last several years. There are signatures that relate to derivatives that you're gonna have mild disease, or in particular related to short-chain fatty acids or isoleucine biosynthesis. Those are patients that clear this very well in contradistinction. The more severe disease has a dysbiosis that's more prolonged. These two biologic products are reduced and these have incre inc incremental changes with longer clearance or more severe disease. So again, things that change uh, related to the biome. I will leave you with one final point about the gut microbiome and as it related to the fountain of youth. This is a very interesting study done in, in mice, but they, they found that age, as we know, triggers a number of metabolic and immune alterations. And in particular, in this model, led to changes in brain function and, and behavior, primarily in the hippocampal, uh, hippocampal area and cognitive function changes. But what they found was the gut microbiome uh, had, a, had a change that also with this resulted in, in host frailty and cognitive changes in these mice. And what they saw was that they took stool from these, these germ-free mice uh, that were derived, uh, and they, they followed them through on the older side, and then took the, the younger mice and transposed that into an older mouse. They actually found that the gut microbiome was more durable. It, again, resembled the younger mice and the older mice now had chemical balances that were much more similar to youth, and they performed more proficiently on tasks and memory mazes, so they, they could get out much more quickly. And why do I tell you this is really important as it relates to the gut microbiome, and, and as we get older, well, it's a real, another reason to be nice to your kids. <laughs> it's not just about the inheritance, but again, be nice and you may, they may come back to help you. So I'll leave you with the conclusions of where are we? Are we at the beginning or are we really, really in the journey? And, and the microbiome changes have been dramatic and they've been developing every day. The understanding of this, again, is just at the beginning. The finding of human disease potential associations we're seeing every day, but we don't really know exactly where we're going. The explosive interest has been replete. Again, you can't pick up a journal, a paper, whatever. Somebody's talking about the microbiome. It's a very active relationship. It can be changed on a minute, and it can change in a day. Again, things that we have to be subject to when we interpret our studies and look at these uh, papers, it's provocative for solutions. We're not there yet. Target interventions, perhaps. Maybe in personalized medicine, that's the ultimate goal because we know exactly what you have. You're not just a patient in a randomized trial. I know how you're going to respond to this therapy. It's important, however, to understand the limitations. We really don't really have all the answers. And it's very important before we jump and launch into technologies and applications and, and develop mitigation strategies based on some of these studies that just are giving us signals and biologic footprints. So with that, I. I look back on some of the launches we've seen over the last uh, couple years and the, the billionaires uh, launches into space and the race they all had and, and one of the Elon Musk first launches, they, they radioed back from the spaceship and said, hey, so we're off and moving fast. Anybody know where we're going? Well, the answer is, I don't not really think we're quite there yet. So I will leave you with a quote from Socrates who said nearly 2,500 years ago, wisdom is just the beginning, wonder is just the beginning of wisdom. And the key, the true key to wisdom, or to true wisdom, is to recognize that you know nothing. And the goal of the discussion today was not to provide you answers, but to potentially get you stimulated to ask great questions. If I've done that, then I've met my goals for discussion with you today, and thank you so much for listening. Thanks, Dave. So it's now my pleasure to uh, introduce um, uh, Shelby Sullivan. Uh, Shelby is at the University of uh, Colorado, uh, an associate professor, and uh, as, we, uh, as we sort of put together the program, we uh, sort of talked around about who would be an ideal person um, to do a, a bariatrics talk or uh, obesity talk, and, and Shelby's name came up uh, time and time again. She's carved out a, a really an amazing uh, program at the University of Colorado and uh, is really, a, a, I think, a rising star in this field. So. We've asked her to, you know, I assume most of the time she talks about uh, morbid obesity and uh, endoscopic treatments and so forth, but we sort of wanted to uh, do things a little bit differently and talk about borderline obesity and really the, the role of the, the general gastroenterologist uh, in obesity management. So um, uh, welcome very much, Shelby. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I, I 
the talks, but first of all, that this has just been a fantastic course. Thank you so much for inviting me. I hope I rise to the elevation of the two talks prior to me. Definitely difficult to follow. Um, so these are my disclosures. So let's first talk about the chronic disease burden uh, with obesity and the financial costs. So obesity is a leading risk factor when developing type 2 diabetes, even when compared with genetic factors and other lifestyle factors. Um, the other thing is that each five kilogram per meter increase in BMI results in increase in, in heart disease and increase in risk for stroke. Obesity leads to a 3.5 fold increased risk of NAFLD, and it may account for up to 14% of all cancer deaths in men and 20% of all cancer deaths in women. Huge costs associated with this, and these are all incremental costs. So the cost above and beyond what you would pay for somebody who is normal weight. So I hope today to kind of um, to kind of convince you that even if you have borderline obesity or even um, uh, even if you have overweight with some comorbidities, that you consider treating using uh, adjunctive therapies. So when we think about lifestyle therapy, this is really uh, diet, physical activity, behavior modification. I'm gonna go through this and what you can actually do in clinic practice. Um, and that I really think of as a BMI of uh, 25 and above. When we think about bariatric endoscopy and pharmacotherapy, that's where we start talking about BMI of 27 and above with a comorbidity or a BMI of 30 and above. When we look at surgery, that is something that's more of a BMI, and I don't know why this is going fast, but a BMI of 35 and above with a comorbidity or greater than 40 without a comorbidity. The one thing I will say is that Using an endoscopic bariatric therapy in a BMI of 27 to 29.9 BMI would be considered off-label for most of these therapies, but new guidelines recommend and bariatric surgery is now being recommended in BMI of greater than 30 with a comorbidity, but this is not yet covered by insurance. I am going to show you some data that will include this population of patients in the endoscopic bariatric therapy groups, so it's something that you want to think about. The other thing I want to mention on this slide is that very few patients are going to be able to lose and maintain a weight loss with lifestyle therapy alone. Very few, probably less than 5%. So we really should be thinking about these adjunctive therapies, but you have to do the lifestyle therapy along with it in order to maximize the amount of weight loss that you get. I can put a balloon in somebody, that's not going to make them want to eat broccoli. That is why you're, you're doing that lifestyle therapy along with it. So let's first talk about lifestyle therapy. And the first thing I'm going to talk about that was diet. And there are lots of diets that have data. And you can see I've just kind of simplified these sort of name diets into their component parts. But there are some common themes with these. They re reduce either the type or the amount of food, reduce or eliminate sweets, reduce or eliminate uh, sugar-sweetened beverages. And they use whole grains when grain products are consumed. The thing about it is, though, is that it probably doesn't matter exactly what you're eating in terms of macronutrient components. This was the Pounds Law study uh, published in 2009, and they looked at four different diets that were so that they were able to compare high fat versus low fat, high carb versus low carb, and high protein versus versus low protein. And what you can see is that weight loss across these different components are very similar. Um, and it didn't really matter if you were on the high or low of any one of these macronutrient components, uh, you were able to lose about the same amount of weight. The thing that did correlate, however, was the amount of times that patients came in for their lifestyle therapy visits. And so the more visits that you have, the more weight loss that you get. And so it's really important to recognize this, and that's why we talk about intensity of lifestyle therapy, and the more often you come in, the better off you are. The one caveat to diet is that there is probably a, a healthiest or healthier diet than the other diets, and that's the Mediterranean diet. It's probably also likely that the blue diet, which is very similar to the Mediterranean diet, will ha at some point have this kind of data as well. But essentially, the Pretty Med study looked at three different groups, control Mediterranean that was focused on nuts, Mediterranean that was focused on um, olive oil, and they didn't lose weight in this study. So that's really something important to know. Despite not losing weight, there was still a difference in cardiovascular endpoints. So so the people who were in either of the um, either of the Mediterranean diet groups, either the nut or the olive oil, had a significantly lower risk of cardiovascular endpoints. Um, so this really demonstrates that despite uh, despite all of the other things I told you about weight loss, in the absence of weight loss, this diet is probably one of the healthiest. The other thing that you can do, and I do this frequently in clinic, is I use meal replacements to help patients make healthier food choices. And this isn't just like shakes or bars, this also includes like frozen entrees. There are a lot of frozen entrees now that are lower in salt, that are Mediterranean type diet, uh, diet um, uh, 
uh, meal replacements that really, it makes it much easier for patients to be able to follow uh, calorie recommendations. So what do we wanna do for exercise? Exercise is really important. It's more important, however, for weight loss maintenance than it is for actual weight loss. This is an older study, but it really kind of proves this point. When we talk about weight loss, we do have a recommendation, and I'm gonna show you this slide in a minute, of greater than 150 minutes per week of exercise. And in this first zero to six month time period is when they were going through their initial weight loss phase, and those patients who exercised more than 150 minutes per week had more weight loss. When we look at the weight loss maintenance phase, and that was six to 18 months, we see that patients who exercised more had more weight loss. So if you exercised less than 150 minutes, you regained a lot of weight. You regained some weight if you were getting at least 150 minutes, but in order to maintain that weight loss, you had to get at least 200 minutes of moderate intensity exercise per week. This is gonna come up later, again, in a couple of slides when we talk about recommendations. So the next thing that's the third component of lifestyle therapy is behavior modification. And these are the pillars of behavior modification. It includes self-monitoring, problem solving, stimulus control, social support, cognitive restructuring, and relapse prevention. But probably the most important of these is self-monitoring. And in studies, this has come up over and over again as being consistently consist consistently more associated with weight loss than the other components of behavior modification. So in a systematic review of 22 studies, there was more frequent and complete self-monitoring of food intake and exercise was consistently associated with more weight loss. And in the um, graph that you can see, this is from a post hoc analysis from a randomized controlled trial that had three arms with weight, uh, lifestyle therapy alone, lifestyle therapy plus liraglutide, or lifestyle therapy plus liraglutide plus meal replacements. And what you can see is that the patients, who, and this, the slide is looking at, uh, the graph is looking at their um, completion of their, um, their uh, food records. And in those patients that, that did uh, food logging every single day, they lost 12.4% 12.4% more weight loss than those who didn't record at all. And in those patients who were only doing lifestyle therapy, they lost, um, the patients who were recording every single day lost as much weight as the patients who were on liraglutide, but were only recording 60% of the time. So it just shows you how important it is to know what you're eating. So when we talk about lifestyle therapy, and what I actually do in clinical practice is I set a calorie goal and protein goal with patients. And the recommendations from the 2013 guidelines that were published in 2014 can give you some very easy ways to do this. So 12 to 1,500 calories a day per women, 50 to 80 grams of protein, 1,500 to 1,800 calories a day for men. I usually do 60 to 90 grams of protein. I'm not getting into kind of the, the protein uh, a lot during this talk, but as in our prior talk, pro high protein diets may actually alter gut microbiome, may have negative effects. Um, they have negative effects also on insulin sensitivity. So I don't necessarily recommend high protein diets. I will definitely manage a patient through that if that's something that they want to do. But I don't usually recommend that in my, uh, in my uh, clinic. And then we also support macronutrient-focused diets if patients want to do that. For exercise goal, we want to start slow and work up. So I don't actually start, if patients aren't exercising before they come in, I don't start with 150 minutes per week. I'll start with saying, let's just start with five to 10 minutes of walking two or three times a week. Can you do that? Is that something that you're able to do? And then we work up slowly from there. Um, if you try to set a goal that's too high for exercise, it'll make patients even less likely to do it. <coughs> Once we get into that weight maintenance phase, we wanna do a little bit more exercise and you wanna add resistance exercise in. This is gonna be really important, especially for patients who are on GLP-1 receptor agonists because it does cause more loss of lean tissue than other methods of weight loss. Um, and this lifestyle therapy can be done by anybody. You can do it in the office, you can have a dietitian, psychologist, behavior coach, a lot of people can do it. In person and over the phone may yield similar results, less if it's internet only and not you're not talking to an actual person. Um, and intensity of lifestyle modification does matter. So more intensity gives you more weight loss. And there doesn't really appear to be in a difference between individual and group visits. Some people really like group, some people really like individual. So that really comes down to the patient. So let's talk about pharmacotherapy, because again, I really want to encourage you to think about adjunctive therapies for any patient who has obesity, mild to the um, severe obesity. 
So we first want to stop medications that cause weight gain, identify patients who will, be, who will benefit from weight loss medications, choose a weight loss medication, and then determine if you should continue it. So when we're identifying patients, again, we talked about this BMI of greater than 30 or BMI of greater than 27 with at least one comorbidity. We want to use it for prevention of weight gain after a device is removed, for patients who have not achieved targeted weight loss with endoscopic bariatric therapies or surgery, and patients who have regained weight after um, at their uh, endoscopic procedures or surgical procedures. So when we look at the weight loss medications, these are a big list of weight loss medications. The most re recent ones that have been approved are semaglutide and terzepatide. These are our big guns. These are the most weight loss with these medications that we've had with anything before. Um, Zepbound is not actually available yet for purchase. It just got approved, I think, two weeks ago um, for the indication for obesity. It is currently available for diabetes, but not for the obesity indication just quite yet. So this slide looks at the percentage of patients who reach at least 10% total body weight loss between week 52 and 72 on these medications. You can see terzepatide, which is a GLP-1 GIP coagonist, is the most out of all of these. So more than 80% of patients are getting at least 10% or more total body weight loss. Semaglutide is still very good at um, almost 70, at about 70% 70 of patients reaching that. And the rest of the medications are really much lower than this. Semaglutide will get um, about 50% of patients to 15% total body weight loss, and terzepatide will get almost 71% of patients to 15% total body weight loss at 72 weeks. But I don't want you to forget about those medications that, I, that were at the tail end of that list because they still work. This study looks at comparison of Qsimia, which is fentramine plus topiramate, as well as the individual drugs. Now, these are cheap. Topiramate is cheap. Fentramine is cheap. And so I still use these a lot. So even though you see more weight loss with, uh, with Qsimia, you still get about... Um, 50% of patients getting 5% total body weight loss and 20 to 25% of patients getting 10% total body weight loss on these medications. And they're cheap. So a lot of patients are not gonna have coverage for the GLP-1 receptor agonists. And they're really expensive, about $1,500 a month for Wigovi. And it's probably gonna be somewhere between $1,000 and $1,200 a month for terzepatide. Um, so contraindications are listed here. Some of the big ones for, for the GLP-1 receptor agonists is history of thyroid cancer, gastroparesis. You've heard this in the news, I'm sure, that there have been issues with, uh, with very seriously delayed gastric emptying and even um, small bowel obstruction um, with these medications. Not common, but they still can happen. So you want to um, keep, uh, keep aware of that. The other thing is a history of pancreatitis. So if a patient has a history of pancreatitis, I typically wouldn't start one of these medications. There are some of my colleagues that would start it if it was just like gallstone pancreatitis and that, you know, gallstone has been removed. I'm still a little bit nervous about starting it in that. The other thing is that you have to remember that these drugs have to be continued long term. If you stop these medications, weight loss will come back on. And this is from the um, a long term trial from looking at patients who are in the step one study with, with Wigovi. So when you determine whether you should continue the medication, they need at least 5% total body weight loss by three months, no significant side effects, and the cost is acceptable to patients. And so I know what you're saying right now, well, well Dr. Sullivan, why would we even need endoscopic bariatric therapies after we have these, um, these great medications? Well, because not a lot of people stay on these medications. So this is a recent analysis of a claims, medical claims um, database, and they, did, they looked at GLP-1 receptor users and control patients. So they did uh, a matched cohort, essentially. And only 32% of patients were continuing to take this medication at one year. And these were patients who were able to fill their, their prescriptions. And the annual cost was significantly more, about $14,000 more to pay for a patient that was on these medications than for somebody who didn't. So it had no cost savings whatsoever, at least not in the first year. And some people will say, well, but we had such an issue with actually getting these medications. That's true, but this data is the same as the data from a study that was published in 2018. People don't stay on medications um, for long, and a lot of people want to lose weight so they can get off of medications. So that brings me to the endoscopic bariatric therapies. We have a lot of therapies that have been in development and some that uh, just don't have a lot of weight loss but have independent effects on, um, on uh, metabolic control. 
But of the ones that are currently available, we really only have two, so I'm gonna talk about these, the overstitch and the um, uh, balloon, or bearer balloon. We have a lot of balloons. These are the different types of balloons, but the ones that are, have been studied in the US are the Orbera, the Reshape, the Spats, the Oblon, and the Olurian. Olurian is still going under a trial right now. It hasn't been approved yet. Oblon is not available currently, but is still FDA approved. Reshape Duo, they did not keep up their regulatory work on this, and so it's not on the market and probably won't come back. Spats has not been commercialized yet, but is approved, and Orbera is the only one that we really have that's available right now. We now have CPT codes that we can use, although this is still not likely to get insurance coverage soon, but hopefully at some point, um, and it's a necessary step towards coverage. When we compare these um, studies, we can see that the sham controlled studies have less weight loss than the open label studies. SPATS balloon, which is in for uh, two months longer than the other balloons, does have more weight loss. But in clinical practice, which includes BMI of less than 30, we see that there is very similar weight loss between all of the balloons. And again, this includes patients who have BMI of less than 30. So again, one of the reasons why I would recommend um, considering off-label use. There's also consistently lower serious adverse event rates for the gas-filled balloons compared with fluid-filled, but this may be actually true for all fluid-filled swallowable balloons, uh, even, even the swallowable um, uh, fluid-filled balloons, although Allurian is, like I said, still undergoing trial in the US, not yet approved here. The one thing I will point out of the non-serious adverse events is reflux, and this does occur in about 30% of patients who have the Orbera balloon, and this is a reason why I have taken balloons out before, so just something to keep in mind if you're going to recommend balloon therapy for patients. The AGA does now have a guideline on intragastric balloon and does recommend using it in people who have failed um, a trial of conventional weight loss strategies. All right, so we're gonna switch gears and talk about suturing and plication, and then really the only one that we have that's widely available is the overstitch device. So this is um, uh, just some video from an endoscopic sleeve gastroplasty. This is a patient who was 27, no comorbidities, baseline BMI was 42, and weight was um, 288. At six months, she had 17.4% total body weight loss. So I just wanna make it very clear, that is as good as the GLP-1 receptor agonist. So again, think about these therapies in addition to the medications um, for these patients. And this is just a additional images of what the stomach looks like during uh, during that procedure. The MERIT study was a randomized controlled trial with a crossover at one year, and what you saw in this study was about 13.6% total body weight loss compared to 0.8 in the control arm. And when they crossed over, they made the, the control arm patients then lost weight when they got the procedure, and the um, active arm patients maintained their weight loss for another year. Um, so we know that there is um, some weight loss maintenance long term with this procedure, at least medium term. Very low amount of serious adverse events and um, just regular adverse events. Most of them are related to accommodative symptoms and resolve quickly. In terms of medium-term weight loss, we have um, about 15.9% total body weight loss at five years in a series out of Cornell. And in a series, uh, a meta-analysis that included almost 1,800 patients, there was weight loss of 16.5 to 17.2% total body weight loss at the one year and the 18 to 24 month time point. We also have a control or a, a, a case comparator study out of the Middle East. This was 3,000 paired matches between sleeve gastrectomy and ESG. They had the same remission of, of diabetes, dyslipidemia, and hypertension, very low serious adverse events, and um, weight loss was 14 in the um, ESG group, 19% uh, in the sleeve gastrectomy group. In general, less weight loss in the Middle East than there is in the US. And they had very good follow-up. 85% of the patients that could have followed up at three years in the ESG group did follow up. So that's really amazing uh, follow-up. So in conclusion, even borderline obesity is associated with negative outcomes and should be treated. Lifestyle therapy includes diet, exercise, behavior modification. You want to do it at least moderate intensity. Um, and there's multiple options for delivering this. And I really want you to consider both medications and bariatric endoscopic procedures for all patients, regardless of whether their BMI goes down to 27, as long as they have one comorbidity. Um, and they are definitely effective. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Shelby, One, wonderful talk. It's next my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Joseph Murray. Uh, he's a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic, uh, and um, he's a, a, a wonderful uh, speaker and a, a, an excellent uh, expert on uh, celiac disease. And we've asked him today to talk about atypical presentations for celiac disease 
uh, when you see these symptoms, when do you suspect uh, celiac disease? So, Joseph, welcome Great. again, Great. My friend. Thank you indeed. It, indeed, it's going to be hard to follow um, those class acts. I'm going to talk about these atypical presentations and when you should um, suspect and test for celiac disease. Just to remind us all, it's an inflammatory state of the small intestine occurring in people who have genetic risk and resolves with exclusion of the disease. It is the third inflammatory bowel disease, but it's often been orphaned and not included. It's a proximal <laughs> small bowel disease. It affects the duodenum and a variable distance down the jejunum into the small intestine with a median length of involvement of about 10%. So it does vary. And indeed, there's even ultra-short celiac disease that only affects the duodenal bulb that has implications for testing. We're going to talk about the typical and atypical symptoms, develop a strategy to detect it, especially in the GI practice, and then what do we do about people who are already avoiding gluten? This is just to remind us about the incidence of celiac disease. It's dramatically increased across all geographies. There is a latitude effect. It is much more common in the northern latitudes than the southern latitudes, but like everybody else, it's migrating south now. <laughs> for many good reasons that we know about today. So, especially those of us from the great north. The clinical manifestations of celiac disease, in yellow, in the yellow box, we think of the, the typical GI symptoms, most of which are not a surprise to us. But it includes things like chronic constipation as a presentation of celiac disease that maybe we don't think about. But it's all of the other presentations that are, extend well beyond the GI tract. And someone has listed these about 360 different types of presentations of celiac disease. But think about it, the, probably the single most important is iron deficiency, that's the most common. And now I think we think of that as a typical, not atypical, but typical. What has happened to the presentations over time? They've gone, and this is just from Ireland, where I'm from originally, where you know, a number of decades ago, everyone had a classic presentation of diarrhea and malabsorption, and that is now the minority case. I would start, always like to start with a case, and this was a lady who reminded me of her 40-year rheumatologic career of polyarthralgias without deformities, um, pretty unremarkable lab tests generally, multiple different diagnoses through her, her rheumatologic career on NSAIDs daily, no digestive symptoms as yet. And this was a question I posed to our fellows and residents. I said, what do you do next? And I give these list of five things. And indeed, none of these five things are wrong. But because I'm talking, it's test your, test your tissue transutaminase. And this patient subsequently became anemic. Um, not surprising. Ferritin was low, her aqua blood was negative, her colonoscopy was negative, but her upper endoscopy had visual changes of atrophy. And this picture and similar pictures is something we need to be aware of as endoscopists. Um, the biopsies showed villous atrophy, and then her serologic test was done, and it was terrifically positive. I've just put up an illustration for an immersion view, a great way to see villi in your upper endoscopies. Put in 200 cc's of water, and you see those villi pop up. And that's a pretty good test for undetected or previously unsuspected celiac disease. So, and this patient, all of her arthralgia symptoms uh, disappeared after a gluten-free diet of six months. Iron deficiency anemia is occurs in about um, it occurs in about 50% of people with celiac disease, about five to eight percent of adults who have unexplained iron deficiency anemia have celiac disease. It's often resistant to oral iron. Um, it's anywhere between five and 15% of people undergoing upper endoscopy for iron deficiency anemia. But that also means that when we as endoscopists are doing, say, open access endoscopy, are we aware that the patient has a history of iron deficiency anemia if they're being sent to us for dyspepsia or some other reason? Maybe not. 4% of Caucasians who have just iron deficiency without anemia may have celiac disease. And there are other hematologic presentations. B12 deficiency, which we more typically associate with either post-surgical changes or, or atrophic gastritis, can also be a manifestation of celiac disease, as can hyposplenism. 
Another scenario is recurring pancreatitis. Now, why would this happen? Well, this would happen because the papilla comes out right in the middle of ground zero for celiac disease damage. You get papillitis or edema and sometimes even stricturing. And this was an old series that Rig Patel and, and Fred Joel and I did at, at the University of Iowa many years ago mm. when there was a great fashion for doing pancreatic manometry. Remember those days? Gosh, I, I, I think most of us are glad they're gone. <laughs> but these patients, are six out of, or 12 out of 169 patients referred for that type of problem with recurring idiopathic acute pancreatitis actually had celiac disease as their cause. Now, initially we were cutting the sphincters to fix it, but you just have to put them on a gluten-free diet. You can also see a similar syndrome affecting um, producing a cholestatic uh, or obstructive pattern on the bile duct as well. There are other abdominal presentations. It can mimic partial small bowel obstruction with air fluid levels on, on imaging. You can have a perforation of the small intestine or stricturing of the small intestine or even lymphoma as shown here. And you can also get into susception. In our series at the Mayo Clinic, about four to somewhere between four and eight percent of patients who come to the ER, they have a CT scan done. It shows small intestinal intussusception. Think of celiac disease as well as those other small bowel disorders like, like polyps and, and small bowel cancers. Um, outside of the GI tract, osteoporosis or osteomalacia, this, was a 40, this is an x-ray from a 45-year-old male who had bone pain and proximal muscle weakness, no GI symptoms, and el elevated alkaline phosphatase from the bone, low vitamin D, and very low bone density. And the problem was celiac disease. Abnormal liver blood tests, so many of us are seeing these patients, incidentally elevated um, transaminases, up to 9% of certain populations may have this. Again, it depends on who you're studying. And remember we talked about those latitude changes. There are also racial and ethnic variations in the occurrence of celiac disease. Liver biopsies in people with celiac disease could show this non-specific reactive hepatitis. I'm gonna show you a picture. And then liver enzymes, often normalize on a gluten-free diet, but there's occasionally severe liver disease. These are uh, the percentages of uh, abnormal liver blood tests in patients with celiac disease, and in some series, it's very common to see abnormal blood tests, and most of them, they resolve with exclusion of gluten. You can also see fairly more substantial inflammation, often with bridging, that can be verging on the autoimmune hepatitis. And I think when you make the double diagnosis of celiac disease and autoimmune hepatitis, you have to be open to the possibility that once you treat their, their celiac disease, you may be able to get them off their drugs to suppress their autoimmune hepatitis. But again, you do that with caution as you would with any patient. But this association, that particular association, autoimmune hepatitis and celiac disease, is especially common in males. So if you see a male with autoimmune hepatitis, you have to think celiac disease. I would suggest you test for celiac disease in anybody with an immune-based liver disease, such as uh, PBC, PSC, as well as autoimmune hepatitis. Outside of the gut, the classic presentation of dermatitis hepatiformis, an exceptionally itchy skin condition affecting the elbows, knees, buttocks, and extensor surfaces. Most have no GI symptoms, but most will have villous atrophy, and they respond to gluten exclusion. There are oral things, like this is a pattern of a dental enamel defect. We will see greater dental loss, for example, in patients with celiac disease. Oral ulceration, many of us will see these patients where, oh, could this be Crohn's disease or inflammatory bowel disease? Also need to think about celiac disease as a presentation of these painful oral aphthous ulcers. Um, how about other skin issues? Urticaria, um, we know urticaria can be associated with, for example, helicobacter, helicobacter pylori can be associated with celiac disease also, and usually the urticaria will resolve once you treat the disease. What about neuropsychiatric associations of the disease? They're so-called gluten ataxia, people who present to the neurologist with ataxia. Peripheral neuropathy, which is usually a distal symmetric sensory neuropathy, is the most common thing we see in celiac disease. Premature dementia, pretty nasty. Mononeuritis multiplex. Depression that does not respond to the oral antidepressants. Unfortunately, there's an increased rate of attempted suicide in teenagers who turn out to have celiac disease, and then their educational and behavioral um, 
problems. This is a brain imaging from a patient who had gluten ataxia, who had this shrunken cerebellum. Once the cerebellum shrinks, the ataxia will never recover. But if the diagnosis of celiac disease is made within six months of the onset of the ataxia, often the ataxia will stop worsening or even improve. But time is critical. Reproductive effects. There's reduced fertility in men and women, increased rate of spontaneous abortion, delayed menarche in girls, early menopause in women. These, many of these, not the menopause, unfortunately, but the others are reversible with the gluten-free diet if you detect it. And really, it's getting our colleagues who look after patients, say, with subfertility and fertility, to think about um, celiac disease, very simple blood tests to do to screen for it. What about rheumatologic patients? My first patient I presented was, but was, was one of those. But there's also inflammatory myositis, sarcoidosis due to some shared genetic factors, as well as um, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome, especially primary Sjogren's, and also a fibromyalgia-like uh, disorder that can be a presentation of the disease. So who gets the disease? It's still much more adults than children, and it is more females than males. There are people at genetic risk, individuals with Down syndrome especially associated with it. It can affect any age. I just had a lady age 80, and she was very upset. Why did I have to wait till now to be diagnosed? Well, she probably did have it for a very long time. Patients with other immune-based disorders, type 1 diabetes in particular, the Sjogren's, autoimmune thyroid disease, lupus, Addison's disease, all of those you need to think about celiac disease. And most especially, and what would be the easiest to find, would be family history of celiac disease. But when you go back to your practice, how many of your practices ask the patients, do you have a family history of celiac disease? We do it for colon cancer, we do it for esophageal cancer, we do it for lots of IBD, but do we do it for celiac disease? That's the single most important way to find celiac disease even in the endoscopy suite. And I ask patients when they come in as I consent them. And that's open access endoscopy. What about the genetics? There's a very strong genetic predisposition. Greatest for monozygous twins and less so um, when it gets to parents and kids than siblings. Strongly associated with HLA types, but they occur in 30 to 40% of the population. There are other gene loci, but they make up of each is a very tiny contribution. And then there are those uh, disorders, Down syndrome, Turner's, and Williams, that are associated with celiac disease. So ask about family history. What do we use to, as the detection? What we suggest to our colleagues in other disciplines? Don't refer them for an endoscopy right away. Do a serologic test. And here's the whole panoply of what's available. TTG IgA is probably the simplest and most available, but you do have to be aware of IgA deficiency, and most labs now will use a cascade where they'll measure total IgA, and if it's low, they will measure the alternative diaminated glide and IgG as a test for IgA in IgA deficient patients. Patients must be on a normal diet. If they're already on a gluten-free diet, you'll get false negatives. What happens when somebody goes and reduces gluten? The sensitivity for each of the individual tests drops substantially, shown here in green. What about biopsies? I've already mentioned ultra-short disease. So if you're scoping somebody, you should take biopsies not only from the second and third part of the duodenum, four pieces, one per pass. Don't stack them doing two. You will crush those villi, and you will make it almost very difficult for the pathologist to interpret. And take at least one or two biopsies from the duodenal bulb. So what about celiac disease for the endoscopist? If this is going to be the first place that we see the patients, it's in, in some populations, certainly very Caucasian, northern um, European populations, 2 to 3% of people with dyspepsia have it. It's 5 to 7% of people with type 1 diabetes, 5 to 8% of people with iron deficiency anemia, 2 to 5% of osteoporosis, especially premature osteoporosis. The patients who have not been tested, who come who've got IBSD, this is very controversial. It's probably, it says 5%, it's probably more like 2 to 5% in, in populations. Um, 5 to 8% of those autoimmune liver diseases, the, the recurrent pancreatitis we've talked about, um, 5 to 10% of people with a family history, and there's a 5 to 10% risk in people with microscopic colitis. Um, I expect to see a case in one in every 50 upper endoscopies 
in people who have never been previously tested for celiac disease. And of course, no biopsies, no diagnosis. What do you look for macroscopically? And you can see things like loss of the folds, for example, when you inflate the, uh, the intestine, the, when you turn the corner, you're looking down the second part, you inflate it, and the folds completely efface. That is much more common in children than it is so much in adult onset disease. There's fissuring and scalloping, there's a mosaic pattern, or you can see nodularity. And this is just fissuring that you can see on the folds. Putting some water in and doing that immersion view increases your sensitivity. What is the sensitivity in all comers? This comes from our Mayo data. Sensitivity was about 50 to 60% endoscopically. The specificity was about 90%. Why? Because there's 10% of villus atrophy that is caused by other things other than celiac disease. Um, there is some non-atrophic celiac disease, people with fairly minor change and you can't see it. And if somebody's treated, you may not see it at all. So biopsy is still critically important. Capsule, for example, which gives you a very nice magnified immersion view, is more sensitive than standard endoscopy with some of those same patterns. What's happening with diagnosis? And just to update you, there is a, a move away from biopsies or trying to avoid duodenal biopsies in children. Now in Europe, over 50% of children diagnosed with celiac disease will not have a duodenal biopsy. They do not need it if they meet these very strict criteria. That is symptoms suggestive of the disease, a tissue transutaminase result that's more than 10 times the upper limit of normal. They carry the HLA type that's supportive and then they respond to a gluten-free diet. And that is very robust data in children. They've now even dropped the requirement for the HLA type. And there's now a move to start at least thinking about that in adults with some data that is supporting it, maybe not quite as, as, as much. This is a suggested schema that Stefan Husby, who, who wrote the European Pediatric Guidelines, myself and Dave Katzka, put together. And it's not been totally endorsed by the recent ACG guidelines, though it's okayed in those who are unwilling or unable to undergo endoscopy, for example, that if you have a very, very positive TTG IgA, you could uh, avoid a biopsy and still have a high certainty. What we don't know is what we would miss by not doing endoscopy in those patients. Are there important things that we would miss in adults? In children, that's not an issue, but in adults, there may be some concern about finding things endoscopically and not relying solely on these very positive serology. But of course, if the serology isn't that super positive, you do have to do endoscopy, and the endoscopy should happen before the person changes their diet. But many of us have tremendous waiting lists before patients can get in. So if you've got a good relationship with your referring physicians, try and give them fast track for the upper endoscopy in someone who is seropositive. What do, we, what do I do about newly diagnosed patients? Remember, there is a sequence of things that need to be checked for, deficiencies, bone density, vaccine status may be important. Um, vac hepatitis B vaccine non-response used to be an issue. It's probably not an issue. Um, in older patients, think about malignancy that's coinciding with their diagnosis. So I will often consider body imaging in people first diagnosed over the age of 50, especially if they have a severe presentation. So to summarize, celiac disease is common in many contexts. Ask about a family history of celiac disease. There are these drive-by diagnoses you'll find in your endoscopy suite. Serology is usually the initial detection, and biopsy confirmation is still needed for many, not necessarily everybody, but many. Use serology if you had a biopsy first diagnosis. If you find villus atrophy, that's your first diagnostic test. Do the serology because that makes it certain that the villus atrophy is due to celiac disease. Remember ultra-short celiac disease, and then there is this biopsy avoidance as possible in children, um, you know, about 50 plus percent of children. And remember what the eye can't see, uh, the eye can't see what the mind does not recognize. And I'll end there, thank you. Okay, thank you uh, so much for uh, really comprehensive talks. We want to do at least uh, maybe one case or, or, and maybe take some questions from the audience uh, here. So uh, Dr. Cavelli uh, has a, a case uh, uh, prepared for our uh, panel. Okay, let me see if I can move this forward. Oh, they're taking over. 
they've taken over in the back. <laughs> huh? Is it frozen or we got? Do what? You want to do it? <clears throat> okay, I got you, Jason. Go ahead. If they can't figure that out, I wanted to, oh, we did, did not have a case for, for bariatrics, and I, I, I thought uh, uh, really Shelby did a, a fantastic job of, of presenting, but if there are any questions from the audience actually on, on any of the talks, uh, we'd be more than happy to, uh, to field those uh, either during the case presentation, if we, we got it yeah, now, we have it uh, or afterwards, so. Okay, go ahead. Well, let's start with one case, and then we'll open up the panel. Okay. Okay. So first case, 34-year-old Caucasian female comes into our clinic, most of our clinics, with significant bloating, which happens daily. She also has intermittent loose stools without any abdominal pain. She's extremely frustrated. She's tearful in clinic, and she pulls out her phone with a number of selfies to prove to me that she has a flat abdomen in the morning, and then, of course, in the evening, she's very distended and bloated and uncomfortable. She denies any weight loss. There's no blood in the stool. She denies any heartburn symptoms, no belching. She's been seen by several gastroenterologists, and she actually sought out a holistic opinion and, of course, was told that she had Canada in her gut, and she went down that pathway without any success. She explained to us that she's had several endoscopies and a colonoscopy, which have been normal. She's tried different medications over time, including Levson, Bentol. She's tried uh, IB Guard, had no relief. She's tried different diets, lactose-free diet, gluten-free diet. She was actually very conscientious with a low FODMAP diet and remains frustrated because she continues to suffer from the bloat. Past medical history is significant for depression and anxiety. She's currently only on Lexapro to treat the underlying anxiety disorder. Her family history, she denies any family history of colon cancer or celiac, no inflammatory bowel disease. Social history really is non-contributory and her physical exam is normal. We collected her workup because she had had an extensive workup over the last couple of years. And the significance is that her lab findings are normal. Normal CBC, her iron studies are normal, CRP is normal, she's had celiac serologies that have been normal, thyroid testing, normal. They checked the pancreatic elastase, it was normal at 218. Fecal calprotectin and her stool PCR and enteropathogen panel were negative. She did have imaging, CT abdomen and pelvis was normal. And she did have adequate endoscopy with biopsies from the stomach and throughout the duodenum to evaluate for celiac, and the colonoscopy with biopsies from the terminal ileum and all throughout the colon were negative for Crohn's or microscopic colitis. When she came to our office, she had a clinic-based lactulose breath test, and it was positive, which is significantly for methane. She did receive a course 14 days of Zyfaxin without any improvement, and this is six months prior to her first visit with us. So at this point in time in our office, our working diagnosis was the fact that she had functional bloating and distension, and then we were also thinking that she had intestinal methanogenic overgrowth, or emo. So I was gonna open this up to the panel, uh, as well as to the audience. So the questions we had were, number one, do we repeat treatment right away for emo with both Zyfaxin and Neomycin for 14 days? Do we repeat the hydrogen breath test, including testing for hydrogen sulfide, which would be the TrioSmart? as the patient did not respond to Zyfaxin the first time? Do we repeat EGD and colonoscopy with biopsies? Do we perform a gastric emptying study? And of course, we're wondering, should we start a neuromodulator such as amitriptyline or Boostbar to treat our symptoms? It's all across the board, probably our, our daily clinic visits, right? Trying to figure out how to go, what, what's the next best step and what is the patient gonna do? So just so you know, the next step, the, she came back four weeks later. Of course, she's still bloating, she's still distended, she's distressed. 
but she was fixated, of course, on the lactulose breath test, so we ordered the trio smart. And again, you'll see here that it came back positive for methane with the diagnosis of emo. So we decided at this point to treat her with both cyfaxin and the combination with neomycin. She comes back three months later. She's been emailing us on the patient portal because she's frustrated, right? She still has bloating, distension, despite the treatment, maybe a little bit better. Uh, she's trying a low-dose you know, fiber diet. She tried IV guard again. And we repeated the Trio Smart breath test out of curiosity for ourselves after treatment with neomycin and zyfaxin, and again, remains positive. So during this time period, we contacted her psychiatrist to talk to her about whether we should start thinking about switching to a neuromodulator to treat functional bloating. So during this time period, we switched her from Lexapro to low-dose fluoxetine. And during that last follow-up visit, she's, she's better. Her bloating, distension is better. It's markedly improved. She's having good bowel movements. Her anxiety is better. And then she also has improved quality of life. So some of the questions I was going to open up to the panel, of course, is does repeat treatment for emo or SIBO helpful to this patient? Did it truly help her? Do we need to recheck a breath test after treatment? If, if yes, when? That's our, let me open up that first. So um, <clears throat> first of all, the, uh, it's nice you could get sulfide because that's not so easy to get in a <laughs> breath test. Not many labs do that. Emo is typically a, a methogenergic. <clears throat> um, is, is more associated with constipation, not with diarrhea. So that would have been <clears throat> a tip, um, but emo is also one that you appropriately did combine it with rifaximin and neomycin because that's the trick when you identify a methogenemic uh, uh, bacterial overgrowth that, that it's a dual antibiotic and they do, emo does better with two antibiotics, so rifaximin alone doesn't work as well. Um, I think this woman also had uh, potentially uh, some benefit. She may have had some abdominal phrenic uh, diaphragmatic uh, dysinertia um, because a lot of these women, uh, a lot of these patients start to learn that and it becomes a behavioral response. So it's, it's the way the abdominal wall behaves differently as it relates to uh, any distension and, and they get very bloated. And I've had luck in using uh, uh, diaphragmatic breathing in some of these people as well, trying to retrain some of them, uh, and, which I find is, is somewhat helpful. But I think your, your, your uh, primary approach was the one that worked. And a lot of the questions we also have in our own clinics is many of our patients are on different psychiatric medications, and is there an optimal path for a GI provider to start a new neuromodulator on a patient who's already on a medication? That's difficult. Go ahead. Um, I would make, um, kind of take a totally different tack. I'm not so keen on giving people one, two, three different antibiotics repeatedly. Um, I'm not, I don't buy the whole idea that it is a treatment for their underlying disorder. Um, I would echo what David said about, I examine these patients upright and I ask them, I separate bloating from distension. They're two different things. Bloating is a sensation of being bloated. Distension is your belly is pooched out. And then I, I examine them upright and it's usually in the afternoon. My clinics are always in the afternoon. And then I lay them down. And if they're still pooched out, I stick my hand under the lower back and ask them to press on it, and their abdomen magically flattens. And then I teach them there's a combination. One is the diaphragmatic breathing, but the other is a very old technique called a stomach vacuum, where you use forced expiration, complete expiration, and then pull your belly button up towards your spine. And it re-strengthens the uh, transversus abdominis muscles that have been often not attended to. Most of our, our exercises that we do nowadays, at least most of the ones I've done, do not exercise that muscle. And you get this, as you said, as David's pointed out, this kind of reflexive distension and then people feel very uncomfortable. This lady also had a CT scan. I show them the CT scan. It goes way back to our old days, you know, when you look at the five Fs, why do people get distended? What distends your abdomen? You know, basically it's not unless it's fat, you know, it could be fat. And I show people, I actually go through, I said, this is what's in your abdomen. You are not any more descended. I think the work from Barcelona suggests that people who feel they've got a lot of bloating and gaseousness don't actually have any more gas in their small intestine. And that's why the key part you've, you've alluded to is how we deal with their psychological issues by whichever means to make that work. But I take a more physical approach. One just 
quick point just for edification too. You knew right off the bat, or should know, I know you did, but um, just for the audience, that this is an irritable bowel, right? There's no abdominal pain. So by definition, it's not irritable bowel. You're not going down an irritable bowel diarrhea pathway. She's got no pain. So I, th I always use that as a discriminant when I'm trying to label somebody uh, or pathways. It's not an IBD, uh, IBSD type patient or, or alternator. Mm -hmm. And just one other point, there may be rapid gastric emptying often goes with this, and you could have a relatively rapid transit with fast emptying of the stomach, a sensation of bloating because of that rapid emptying of gastric contents into the small intestine. So I will talk to them about slow eating, not an eight-minute meal, you know, stretch your meal out to an hour. Some of these things can make a significant difference to their symptoms. It goes along with the anxiety management. Incredibly complex. <laughs> wow. Are there any questions uh, from the audience? We've sort of done all the talking and, and so forth. Any questions? Sure. Uh, can we bring a microphone around and up here front? Yep. Thank you. Uh, very relevant discussions and I'm an uh, outpatient in GI, and so see a lot of those cases. One of the things, one question from Joseph is, uh, these days, like, you know, PCP is checked, celiac disease, the titers are high, sometimes less than 10 times, upper limit of normal level, and then they send to us, after starting patient on gluten-free diet already. And the patient has been feeling fantastic, symptoms improved, they're already on it for a month, then it becomes difficult to tell them to now go back to regular diet and then do an endoscopy. So how do you deal with that situation? So it depends how long they've been gluten-free. If they've been gluten-free for a month and they're 60 years old, they will not have healed their intestine. You can, make the, you can scope them and still make the diagnosis. If there's going to be a week between the time you see them and they get scoped, you say, go back eating gluten, please, as much as you can tolerate until I scope you. If, on the other hand, it's six months have gone by, then it's going to be much harder to make a diagnosis endoscopically. A very older, much older patient, 60s and 70s, they will not likely have healed, and you could still do it. A younger patient, I judge it, I'll do their HLA type, I'll seek out other risk factors, and I'll make a best guess. But if their test result, let's say it's a TTG IgA in our lab, normal is less than four, and let's say it's five, the chances they have celiac disease, even with a response to a gluten-free diet, is probably still only 50%. And so I'm going to try and encourage that patient to go back on a gluten-containing diet, if I can. I'll do the HLA type. If they don't carry the HLA type for celiac disease, they can't have celiac disease, essentially. There are very rare exceptions, but I will do that. But, but that's, an ex that's, that's both extremes. So the length of time they've been gluten-free, how old are they? and how positive or how certain you were that they actually have celiac disease. But don't rely on the response to a gluten-free diet of their symptoms as being indicative. It's a, it's a toss-up. Joe, you, you've taught us so much about celiac. There, there are a couple things that I always also do is, is I, I get them to tell me what, uh, what their diet is, but the dietitian really helpful to, to better elaborate, in particular in some of the irritable bowel stuff where, that, that Jennifer was talking about. And I always get a dietitian FODMAP. I don't even understand how to explain that to people, but anyway, it's, it's easy to hand that off, and the dietitian is much more helpful. The, the other things, though, that I, I found is some people are invariably quite sensitive. To, maybe they're doing okay on their intake, but it's their makeup and their soaps and their lip balm and other things that have gluten analogs, and, they, and you really have to educate some people that are fragile, gluten sensitive, and, and those are aspects. The other is just an, an, invariably when they go out to eat, um, they may be on a gluten-free diet, uh, and the restaurant may advertise that, but studies have shown that, that they actually they cross mingle pots and they don't always have the same type of, uh, of, of adherence to a true gluten-free. So just uh, you have to be a good detective when you start to look at people slow to heal. And, and some of that is anticipatory. So we did a study where we took patients with non-celiac, so-called non-celiac gluten sensitivity, believed they were, they were insensitive to gluten but didn't have celiac disease people who had celiac disease, and we challenged them with a single dose of gluten. Everyone got symptoms. It didn't matter if they got gluten or we gave them the sham. They all got symptoms. So anticipatory symptoms are great. So a lot of your patients who come say, I smell gluten as I'm going past the bakery and I get sick. That's anticipatory. That's not directly by immunological response. It's anticipatory. There are people who are exquisitely sensitive. And I've had just had a patient this week whose medication 
changed, and this is a prescription medication, um, changed from one brand to a generic. And when they contacted, they got sick, they were sick for eight months. And when they contacted the manufacturers, oh yeah, we have, there's gluten in that medication. And that's, be, well, that's becoming more common. It was extremely rare. So there are some people who have that, especially if it's repetitive exposure to low levels. But we also have to be aware of anticipation. Another common scenario we see is on pathology, uh, you know, a lot of increased intraepithelial lymphocytes without any architectural damage and without any other clear-cut obvious reason. It's How a, do you even approach it? It's a pity the pathologist mentioned celiac disease in that description. It's only about 6 to 8% of people who just have increased intraepithelial lymphocytosis but normal architecture have celiac disease as a cause. What do you do when you see those patients? Hopefully we get to them before they've gone gluten-free. Do their serologic test. If their serologic test is positive, then they may well have a relatively mild form of celiac disease. The other challenge is if the biopsies are so badly distorted that all the pathologists can make out is that there are increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, that's where you really can't judge. And again, serology and HLA type are important. But I see so many people where I reverse, I reverse the diagnosis of celiac disease and more people that I make the diagnosis of celiac disease. And that is one of them. What does cause that intraepithelial lymphocytosis? Helicobacter pylori, downstream IBD, NSAIDs, for example, will do that. Um, not sure about whether small intestinal bacterial overgrowth does that or not. I think that's debatable. All right. I need to close uh, this discussion uh, because we need a little bit of break.